A small kitchen, which today was bustling with activity, was illuminated by the rays of the setting sun. A plump woman, bustling about in the kitchen, giggled as she discussed with her son the recent events in the family that had caused a storm of disapproval and even some cutting remarks directed at her daughter. Instead of supporting her daughter, the plump woman preferred to laugh at her and mock the fact that her late grandfather had left her a crumbling house that nobody wanted and which she wouldn't even be able to sell properly. Probably thinks her whole life will magically improve now. Shouldn't have left her husband. So what if he drank? At least he always came home from work. And if he drank, let him sleep it off. What was all that fuss about? The mother continued to repeat, chuckling and mocking her daughter's decision. But what was even more amusing to her was that now she believed that the inheritance would be a real punishment for her daughter because the problems with this house were much greater than any profit she could make from it. I shudder just thinking about that old house of grandpa's. The amount of work there and the fact that it's practically worthless make my knees shake. How could that house end up with me, she said. And I'd be dealing with it now, Nicholas said, smiling and glancing at his mother, who nodded in agreement. Kelly had no idea that at that moment her mother and brother were sitting in the kitchen, chatting, judging her, and laughing at her. She had no time for that right now. Yes, if she found out, she wouldn't be surprised by their behavior. Molly placed a large pie on the table, and a wonderful aroma filled the small kitchen, making it suddenly much cozier than before. Just imagining how much cleaning and fixing up needs to be done there makes me uneasy. There were always plenty of problems with that house, even when Grandpa was alive. He was constantly repairing and patching it up. And now she's going to take on repairs? My goodness. Nobody would even buy that house. It's pointless to deal with it. It's as if he left her that house just to laugh at her later. Like, here, I left this for you. Now figure it out, Molly said, laughing again at her daughter, who received such a strange bequest from her deceased grandfather. Molly wouldn't tell her son that she was upset that the house didn't go to her, even though she understood that she wouldn't deal with it, wouldn't sell it. It would just rot in that big village. She would simply forget about its existence. But the thought that her father would leave her a house would warm her heart. But her father left her nothing. He passed the inheritance to his granddaughter, and the inheritance stated that the entire house and everything in it belonged to her. Listen, Mom, what do you think? What if there really is something in that house? I don't know. What if there are some hidden treasures? The boy asked his mother. But she quickly shook her head. I know my father inside out. Believe me, I've known him all my life. This man couldn't even save a couple of bucks to not spend on something. There are no hidden treasures there. And the house itself, you know, is far from perfect. So, in a way, he left her a burden as an inheritance. He would have done much better if he hadn't done this, Molly said, patting her son on the head, and he immediately stuffed a piece of still hot pie into his mouth. Nicholas nodded, remembering his grandfather, but his memories of him were fragmented. What his mother said clearly reassured him, and he no longer intended to dwell on how much it upset him that he got absolutely nothing from his grandfather. Not even a rundown shed, while his sister got a whole house. Yes, it was hard to call it a house. Because living there was practically impossible due to its age and the fact that the old house constantly needed maintenance, which he didn't want to do. Yes, and Nicholas had plenty of other problems, like his wife, the little child who cried and screamed so often that Nicholas began to think it was time to break away from the family. Because it annoyed him to no end, and he stopped sleeping properly, literally stopped living normally. Now all the relatives laugh that Grandpa left the beloved granddaughter an old house. They laugh at her and tell her to abandon this house. That's the kind of grandfather he was, such a strange one, decided to play a joke. 
like he left her an inheritance. In reality, he left her a real burden, and she, silly girl, doesn't listen to anyone. Says, if Grandpa left it, then it must be necessary. So, there must be something in that house, Molly said, smirking, still not believing, as if, in her own words, and thought that everything was far from those thoughts that were swirling in her daughter's head. At that moment, Kelly sat outside the boss's office, waiting for her turn to be called in. She was trembling with the realization that she might also be affected by the layoffs, like all the other employees who had been unceremoniously ejected from the office today. Some were in tears, some were cursing, and some were silent with triumphant expressions on their faces. This was not the kind of workplace worth clinging to with all one's might. But Kelly held on because it was the only place that had accepted her without experience and at such a young age, where employers usually said, you'll go on maternity leave soon, give birth, and we won't hire you back. Kelly, come in, said the tall, fair-haired secretary, casting a glance at the distressed Kelly, immediately implying that nothing good could be expected from this conversation. A new broom sweeps differently, the secretary said calmly, so that whoever was in the office couldn't hear her. Kelly didn't need the meaning of those words explained. Not long ago, as soon as their office management changed, global changes began, which ended for everyone either with dismissal, demotion, or some catastrophic decisions that left people suddenly without jobs, without payouts. They were simply thrown out of the office, indicating that they wouldn't pay anything, not even for the time worked. Kelly was a little lucky. She was literally put up for review by the management after she received her salary, and she knew she had at least a small amount that would help her stay afloat for a while. So, gather your things and leave. My daughter will be here soon. You'll show her what responsibilities you had here. She'll take your place. Do you understand me? The boss said, giving her a quick glance, but not looking at her again. And why do you think I'll help her at all? Kelly asked, not understanding why she should pretend to be a mentor to some girl who would take her job. Because you still work here. I'm your boss, so don't try to be smart. Go quickly, show her what to do. Otherwise, I'll quickly kick you out of here and won't pay you anything at all. Do you understand me? The boss snapped. Kelly chuckled. Well, you haven't paid anyone anything anyway, so there's no need to scare me. Frightened, Kelly said, grimacing. I won't show her anything. I've spent years learning this position, and you want me to show her in a couple of clicks what to do. Do you think it's all that easy? Let her figure it out herself if it's so easy. But when you realize that this job requires education, when you realize that you can't cope without me, don't call me. You'll have to figure it out on your own. Kelly turned sharply on her heels, leaving the office before the boss could launch into another tirade, clearly displeased with how easily she had been put in her place. She hadn't expected this outcome at all. As Kelly closed the door, she heard outraged exclamations coming closer to the door. You foolish girl. Look, now nobody will hire you. You'll understand later how wrong you were. You still have time to think. Leave the office, that's it. Write it off. You won't get a penny, the boss exclaimed, her eyes flashing clearly feeling superior to this young girl whom she had now left without a job. Yeah, to hell with you. To hell with your money, Kelly said. And she went to her desk to gather her things, pack them into her bag, dress, and leave. To never return to this office again. She understood that now without a job it would be difficult and hard for her. She understood that now she needed to make every effort to somehow return to a normal way of life. So it would be easier for her. So she wouldn't have to ask her mother for help, who would laugh at her once again. 
Right now, all her relatives were laughing at her for inheriting that crumbling, huge, unwanted house in the village from her grandfather. They believed it had fallen into disrepair over the five years no one knew about the will. As Kelly drove home, she replayed everything that had happened in her life over the past few days and thought that for all these months she hadn't been happy at all. And her whole life had turned into some kind of imitation of happiness. Darn it, Kelly, I knew they'd fire you too, came a familiar voice. And when Kelly looked up, she saw her friend and colleague standing near her house. I sensed something. I thought, let me wait for you here. Maybe in an hour, well, maybe two, you'll definitely come by. She's such a piece of work, this new boss. But what can you do? Nothing will change. But now it's unlikely that we'll find a job quickly. Kelly nodded, gestured for her friend to follow her into the small apartment she rented. They took off their outerwear, and now, alone together, Kelly noticed that her friend was on the verge of tears. It was clear that her friend took the dismissal much harder than Kelly herself. I really don't know what to do now. My husband will throw a fit again that I'm jobless. He'll shout, there'll be a scandal again. I don't even want to go home, her friend said, still looking at Kelly, hoping for some advice. And what are you planning to do? Honestly? When I left the office, I had no idea what to do. But as I was driving here, I thought maybe I should just leave everything behind and go away. Don't look at me like that. It's just that my situation isn't like yours. You have a husband, a child, you have responsibilities towards them. And I have no one, I can just up and leave. No one here will help me, I won't be able to afford the rent. So I'll just go to the village, settle in that same house my grandfather left me. You know, everyone laughs at me now because my grandpa left me that dump. But I have nowhere else to go now because I simply can't ask for help from my mother or brother, Kelly said, shrugging. And suddenly her friend realized that her situation wasn't as hopeless as her friend's. Are you sure you want to leave? Her friend asked, seeing the doubt in her face. No, I'm not sure at all. I just don't have a choice. If after all these years of living in the city, I'm destined to go to the village and get bogged down in some trivial matters there, then so be it. Because I'm no longer going to fight against this tidal wave of problems that keeps crashing down on me, Kelly said, shrugging. Simply because she was really tired of fighting against all these twists and turns of life that were wearing her down from the inside. She spent the whole evening packing, sorting things out. She only took the essentials. And she just wanted it all to end. When the phone rang, she didn't even want to pick it up because she saw it was her brother calling. Most likely, her colleague, who was close to him, had already blabbed to him that she had been fired. So he was calling just to make fun of her. So, darling, how's your new life? Going to the countryside now that you're broke? Nicholas laughed, adding insult to injury. She regretted picking up the phone, hoping that her suddenly changed brother would support her instead of pushing her deeper into this pit of problems. Nicholas, did you forget you're supposed to be my brother? You're my blood. Can't you support me? At least morally. At least say something nice to me. Is that so hard? She lashed out at him, hoping he'd admit his own fault. But it was evident he had no intention of doing any of that. God, your life is such a mess. And now you expect me to always support you? You're already an adult, so solve your own problems, he said, then laughed and continued, are you going to that dump? You think Grandpa hit something there? That miser wouldn't even share a penny. I'm surprised he left you that house at all. Go there, see for yourself. Maybe there's nothing left but ruins. Nicholas laughed again, and she simply hung up. 
She put him on the blacklist because she didn't want to see his number on her screen anymore. Because she was so tired of his taunts that it was simply disgusting to communicate with him. She didn't understand why other families were like families, and she was literally forced to fight with her relatives to prove that she wasn't what they thought she was. When the things were packed into a bag and a backpack, she walked out and headed to the bus station to catch a bus to the village. Maybe her friend, mother, and brother were right, and it was worth just selling this house as it is, making some money, and leaving it temporarily while she looks for other ways to earn some extra income. She loved her grandpa. Grandpa was perhaps the only person who always helped her, who always had her back, and with whom she spent all her childhood, while her mother was occupied with who knows what, leaving her in the care of her old father. Kelly didn't know her own father, and her mother never talked about him. And when little Kelly asked about her father, her mother just got very angry, and there was no point in those questions at all. She trudged along the rows of similar multi-story houses, recalling her childhood in the village and wondering if she was as happy then. But can she find happiness there now? She hadn't seen this house for a long time. She realized that without care over the years, it probably turned into a pile of junk. But she couldn't just leave. Just abandon what her grandpa left her. Because she was sure he didn't leave her all this for no reason. She boarded the bus, looking around. It seemed to her that she just couldn't stay. She must go and see, even if there would be piles of junk. She will try to settle in this little village. Maybe even find some shabby job, because she really didn't want to return to the city. She sat on the bus, occasionally glancing around and thinking about how she would rebuild her life. How she would have to work, independently tidy up this house, because there's probably nothing to tidy up there at all. Or the situation is so dire that she won't be able to handle it with her own hands. The bus started moving, and her train of thought changed slightly. And from feeling a little easier, she felt that very soon she would be able to move away from all these thoughts a little. And when she arrives, when she tackles all this physical labor, she will be able to temporarily forget about her mother, her brother's words, about all these taunts that have been haunting her ever since it became clear that Grandpa left her an old house in the village. Kelly got off the bus, slowly heading towards that same house, trying to remember where it was, because she hadn't been here for about five years. Lately, she only saw her grandpa in the hospital because he spent all that time there. And she helped him, seized any opportunity to make his existence easier. But life and death took everything into their own hands. Oh my God! Kelly? Is that really you? asked the elderly woman, raising her hands and rushing to hug the girl. I was looking at you, not sure if it's you or not. You look alike, but also so grown up. But as I came closer, I see it's really you. My heart just squeezed. Oh, remembering your grandpa always lifts my spirits, the grandma said. Grandma Maggie, I didn't know you were still here. I thought your son took you away, Kelly said, genuinely happy to see her. My son went abroad. Our village is on the rise. We even got some new shops opened here, and even a cinema appeared. So, life is bustling here. And you, I suppose, came to your grandpa's house? The house is old, but someone has been taking care of it all this time. It looks quite charming. Sometimes a team comes, does some repairs, and the house still stands. If you ever get hungry or feel lonely, come to me. I'm always happy to see you. Grandma said, patting Kelly's slender hand. Kelly warmly thanked the old lady. She was glad to have a familiar face again. She remembered this granny and remembered how she used to come to her grandpa's, how they spent a lot of time together and how she was always ready to take the girl and if Grandpa was called to repair another unit at the local dairy factory. 
She bid farewell to her. Grandma went towards the market, and Kelly went to the house, which for some unknown reason was being looked after by someone. When she finally reached the house, when she inspected it from top to bottom, she stood at the gate, hesitating to enter because as soon as she entered, her life would change immediately because here she was destined to stay. And perhaps, by staying in this house, she would condemn herself to this existence. She turned the gate handle, it creaked open, reminding her of that creak from her childhood. Returning her to the same memories, making her shudder at the mere thought that nothing of this could be brought back. She looked at the house once again before stepping inside, feeling something tremble inside her. As if something inside urged her to stop, urged her to turn back and leave. She didn't understand where this feeling came from because she loved this house. Because she always loved coming back here. But for some reason, right now there was this unpleasant feeling that had never appeared before. She entered the house and saw that indeed, someone was carefully looking after it. And when she went through it from top to bottom, it seemed to her that whoever was taking care of this house would definitely not be pleased that now the house had a real owner. By the documents, this house belonged to her, so she couldn't understand who needed to take care of a house that never belonged to them. But now she tried not to think about it. When the time comes, she will find out the truth. And now she could just spend time inspecting everything here carefully and at least draw some conclusions about what to do next. Kelly didn't want to sell the house. Despite being reparable and constantly maintained, it was still quite old. She wanted it to be her last refuge because she didn't plan to return to the city. Especially not to stay there. What did this city give her? Unhappy work, humiliations from relatives, mockery from her mother. Yes, who knows what else was sent her way. She wanted to finally end all this, break free from this vicious circle forever. When she went to bed, she struggled to fall asleep. She kept tossing and turning, unable to understand what was happening. Some inner turmoil stirred her, and she couldn't calm herself down, sinking deeper into a kind of forgetfulness that hardly resembled sleep. It didn't surprise her because she always slept poorly in unfamiliar places, finding it hard to drift off. Especially now, when she was here all alone. Suddenly, she heard her grandpa's voice and startled. Kelly sat up, hearing her grandpa calling her again. Shaken, but as if she pulled herself together, she looked around, got out of bed. Kelly walked into the hallway and saw her grandpa, who looked exactly as she remembered him before he got sick. He beckoned her to follow him, and she did. He climbed up the attic stairs, and she wanted to follow him, but then she shuddered. She grabbed onto the broken staircase as best she could, feeling it about to collapse. When she looked down, she realized she wasn't at home at all, that she was hanging, literally, over an abyss. And she felt so scared that she screamed and woke up. It was already morning. Sunbeams illuminated the room where she slept. Rubbing her eyes, she got up with difficulty. She didn't understand what this dream was about. But she promised herself that from today on, she would climb into the attic and see what was there. She rarely visited there even in her childhood. To be honest, she was there only once. And the rest of the time, the attic either scared her or her grandpa forbade her to go there, arguing that there were too many important things for him that he wanted to keep secret. She drank the coffee she brought with her, glanced towards the attic. She decided there was no point in putting it off until tomorrow. She changed into more spacious home clothes that she didn't mind getting dusty. She took a spray to fight spiders with her, and now she was ready to fight old memories. She lowered the ladder, climbed up to the attic, and found that everything here was wrapped in plastic. She didn't expect that whoever was taking care of the house clearly cared about there being many things in this attic that someone might need someday. Or maybe someone would just keep them as a memory. 
The attic was deserted, filled with sunlight from a huge round window. She gradually started removing the plastic, examining everything there was. And she stopped her gaze on an old huge chest standing in the corner. She went down, brought it from the shed, unlocked it, and knelt down to examine everything hidden in the chest. There were some old drawings vividly demonstrating how her grandpa missed his profession when he retired. There were sketches, some interiors, some inventions again. And then, at the bottom of this huge chest, she saw a small velvet-covered box. Curiosity was much stronger than fear of what could be in the box. And without a second thought, she opened it right away. Kelly involuntarily screamed, then immediately composed herself. She absolutely did not expect to see such luxurious jewelry in this simple yet beautiful box, which seemed unnatural for this house, for this box. Yes, not even for her grandpa, who had never had such treasures in his life. Grandpa lived modestly, never spending money unnecessarily, trying to save on everything possible. Putting aside her curiosity once again, Kelly set the box aside. But she couldn't resist, and a few days later, she went back to the city to visit an acquaintance who could appreciate such a find. Little did Kelly know that the discovery in the attic would completely turn her life upside down. James, hi. I called you yesterday. Can you take a look? Kelly asked, entering some kind of basement, seeing her former classmate. But as soon as he took the box in his hands, as soon as he opened it and saw these monograms and patterns, he immediately put it down on the table and jumped up. Get out of here with this. You weren't here. I didn't see you. You didn't bring me anything, he quickly said, stuttering. And she understood that it wasn't as simple as she thought. James, what's wrong? I found this box at my grandpa's in the attic. So don't think it's anything dangerous. He left me the house. I checked the whole house, found this box in the chest. I wanted to know how much it's all worth, she said. But James immediately shook his head negatively. Okay, here's the address. Go, figure it out yourself. Do you even know whose monograms these are? Oh my God. What trouble have you gotten yourself into? I thought when you came to the village, you'd have fewer problems, and you found problems there too, he said to her, quickly writing down the address on a piece of paper. It's the Countess of Bavaria. I don't want to say anything. Figure it out yourself. You weren't here. I didn't hold this box in my hands. Do you understand me? To say that Kelly was stunned by such a reaction would be an understatement. She was just so surprised, so confused that at first, she thought this reaction was some kind of joke. That he didn't actually want to act like this. But he had to. Maybe because he didn't want to see her himself. Or maybe because he had already lost his mind, spending whole days in this room without going outside. When she stepped out of that semi-basement room, it seemed to her that everything had changed, both outside on the street and among the passers-by. But this was, of course, a deceptive impression, and she didn't want to force herself to think that she had really gotten herself into trouble again. When she went to the address, she still kept the box in her backpack, holding it tightly to herself so that no nimble hand, like those that often appear on minibuses, would reach her not to pull out this treasure, which was clearly also dangerous. Strangely enough, Kelly didn't feel any danger. She wanted to go to the owner of these jewels, ask how they ended up with her grandpa, and if she needed to give them back, she would, because James assured her that it was absolutely impossible. No jeweler, no buyer of stolen goods would take them, fully understanding to whom these jewels belonged. When she approached the house, which more resembled a miniature copy of a castle, she was amazed, not understanding who owned all this place. She pressed the button, and a screen lit up. Someone answered her. She said that she probably brought things that the countess needed. 
When asked what exactly she brought, she showed the necklace on the screen. Immediately, guards came out of the courtyard, and then, following them, as if behind a living shield, came a thin old lady who looked as if she was at least two hundred years old. My dear girl, what are you doing here? Show me what you brought, the old lady asked, her voice so squeaky that it was simply unpleasant to hear. Killy took out the box from her backpack. When she opened it, she saw how shocked the old lady was. She mumbled her lips and couldn't say a word. She was shaken by what she saw, and she couldn't find the strength to say a word. All the guards became alarmed, exchanging glances, and Kelly saw that they were clearly tense. And now, indeed, she became scared. She stepped back a little, taking a few steps back, but the old lady firmly clasped the box that Kelly was holding. Where did you get this? Just tell me honestly. Even if you stole it, I won't hand you over to the police. Tell me, where did you get this? The old lady inquired, hoping to get an answer. My grandpa left me the house. I found a chest in the attic, and there, in the chest, I found this. Here's a picture of my grandpa. I always carry it with me and ask him for advice when I'm in trouble, no matter how silly it sounds, Kelly replied. It can't be, said the old lady, trembling hands pulling out the necklace and earrings from the box and, still not believing her eyes, still spasmodically holding onto the box. These are my great-grandmother's jewels. I saw them. This is a family heirloom, the greatest wealth of our family. When we lost them, everything started to fall apart. Everyone started to suffer. I'm sure this necklace gave strength to everyone in our family. When my great-grandmother was dying, she said she gave it to the one she loved most in the world, to curse him. And now it turns out that everything was so close. And I turned the whole world upside down, but I never found them, and these treasures came to us on their own. Kelly listened to her, but she hardly understood anything because the old lady's voice alternated between clear and dry, making it almost impossible to listen to, as it resembled the squeak of an old door that hadn't been oiled for too long, and rust flakes fell off the hinges with every movement. The old lady was clearly not just shocked. She was genuinely happy with what she saw, and the girl understood that she was unlikely to be able to take back these jewels. And, in fact, she wasn't planning to, because it made no sense. Because if these jewels really belonged to another family, then so be it. Robert, make sure this girl lacks nothing. My God, I can't believe it. Has everything come full circle in my old age? I will be grateful to you for the rest of my life. Now go, they will write to you or call you. Everything will be fine in your life now, the old lady said, still shaking her head in disbelief, looking at the jewels she held in her hands and never letting go of them. Wait! The old lady took off a luxurious gold brooch with diamonds and handed it to the girl. Kelly turned it over in her hands, still not understanding what to do with it, because she couldn't accept such an outrageously expensive gift. She wasn't an appraiser, but she at least understood that it was very expensive. If by chance the money they transfer to you is not enough, you can always sell this brooch. There are no monograms here, and then the appraisers will take it. And you can be sure that this money will last you a long time. But listen to my advice, this brooch has saved me more than once. And so I just want you to know that what you did brought happiness to an old lady who, despite all this crazy money, was unhappy her whole life, the old lady said dryly. Kelly looked at her one last time. And now that same Robert approached her, handing her something in an envelope. She thought it was money. But when she took it and squeezed it, she realized it was a plastic bank card. And without a second thought, she immediately went to the bank. But when she found out what account was behind this card, what an insane amount was there, she found it hard to believe. Kelly returned to the village, still somewhat stunned, 
tightly gripping the gift that the old lady had given her in her hands. As if guided by an inner instinct, Kelly returned upstairs. She again plunged her hands into the chest and, after painstakingly sorting through all the drawings, found a fairly thick envelope at the bottom, inside of which was a long letter. She carefully read it again and found that her grandfather had written this letter just a few days before he was hospitalized, sensing that he was getting worse. In this letter, he wrote that once his father gave him this, saying that these jewels should never be returned under any circumstances. Grandpa just wanted to return them, but couldn't muster the courage. And then he simply chickened out and boldly confessed in this letter. He wanted her to take them back. He wanted the curse brought by these jewels to finally be lifted and his granddaughter to be happy. The letter revealed another secret. It turned out that all the money her grandfather saved, he deposited into the account, and money was withdrawn from this account every six months, and craftsmen came to restore the house. And these accounts could not be emptied, so this house would be taken care of for at least another ten generations after his death. When Kelly realized how much money she had at her disposal, she distributed it all to the accounts. She completely renovated the house and now just lived for her pleasure, engaging only in her favorite activities, knowing that nothing else bothered her. Of course, both her mother and brother eventually found out that she had some crazy money and now cursed each other for not insisting that the house be passed on to them because now they would have to survive by any means while the girl they laughed at enjoyed life, forever forgetting what work was. Grandpa left his beloved granddaughter an old house, and while her relatives giggled at her, the discovery Kelly made forever changed her life. 